All right, we will discuss this topic now with the first panel. Um, I hope all guests are here. We had an issue with Deutsche Bahn. Uh, I don't wonder about this. So, um, first of all, Vladimir Zinchenko, Green Line Yachts on stage. Thank you. Perfect. Then I have Jan Meyerhofer, Desk Officer for Recreational Craft Directive, European Commission. Thank you. No, this is my seat. You take this. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, that's fine. Just take a seat. Yes. Not this one. This is mine. <laughs> Linus Voskaridis, Policy Officer for Coastal and Maritime Tourism, <laughs> European Commission, and Robert Marx, Council Member, <clears throat> EBI and President, Bundesverband Wassersport Wirtschaft. We have to use this German here. Thank you. So, thank you. Please take a seat. So, welcome everybody. How was the first day of the show? Busy. Very busy? busy okay. Busy. For me, I just you, arrived. You arrived, you had this issue, and um, thank you for coming. No it was uh, on time, really. Last minute. Linus arrived today or yesterday? Yesterday. Already? Yesterday, yesterday already, yes. And Robert, how was the first day? I arrived Thursday already, so um, oh. yesterday was uh, very good compared also to 2020 and the years before, so the exhibitors are happy. Okay, perfect. I'd like to start maybe because you are better than me in this. If you introduce yourselves, just one or two minutes. Um, what are you doing, what is, how your company or your uh, institution is uh, involved into, in sustainability? Vladimir, do you like to start? Yes, please. Uh, my name is Vladimir Zinchenko. I'm the owner of the Greenland Yachts Company, uh, which started developing hybrid and electric propulsion system in 2008. From that time, was delivered to customer over 1,000 uh, hybrid and electric boats. Uh, we globally supply uh, boats around the world. And for today, we can say we are a single company in the world who are able to present you the full fleet with the electric uh, hybrid or traditional propulsion system. Okay, thank you. Jan? Good morning. Yeah. My name is Jan Meyerhofer. Uh, I'm working in the European Commission as a desk officer for the Recreational Craft Directive. Um, I work in particular in the directorate called for Enterprise and Industry, where we do a lot of technical standards and technical norms uh, for the EU technical harmonization legislation. And uh, one of those legislations is legislation related to recreational boats. Thank you. Thank you. Linos? So my name is Linos Vascaridis, and I work for the European Commission, Director General for Maritime Affairs and Fisheries, uh, especially in the unit for uh, blue economy and uh, maritime special planning. In the frame of the blue economy, we have as well the coastal maritime tourism, which is my responsibility. And uh, for today's panel, mainly working on the uh, future of, of the marinas of the future. So how we see the marinas in the future. Thank you. And last but not least, Robert. Yeah. Yes, thank you. My name is Robert Marx. First of all, I'm an entrepreneur. I'm importing engines to Germany. Um, outboard and inboard engines, but I'm uh, president of the German Marine Association since 20 years, and I'm also council member of EBI in uh, Brussels. All right, so um, maybe as a start, and Petros mentioned already, I mean, you weren't here, but he said boats in, the, in Europe, they contribute just 0.1% to all these emissions. Um, it's not a lot. But um, why do we do this enormous effort in terms of R&D? Is it when, we will re when will we reach this zero percent? Maybe Jan is uh, very involved in this. What do you think? I mean, it's really a small percentage, right? Um, thank you. Uh, I will just clarify it. Uh, 0 0.1 percent is... Uh, uh, carbon dioxide emissions. Uh, then we have other emissions which uh, have different, slightly different, different shares. Uh, it's true that it's a 0.1 uh, in comparing to all EU sectors um, carbon, uh, carbon dioxide emissions. However, um, it's 0.4% uh, related to transport sector, EU transport sector. 
and it's still 3 million tons of carbon dioxide per year. Um, recreational boats are not emitting only carbon dioxide. They emit also carbon monoxide in quite high numbers. And uh, share of carbon monoxide, share of recreational boat, is about 2.5% uh, of, of all EU sectors, which is already a bit higher number. And it's because there is still plenty of uh, petrol outboard engines which are not catalyzed. Still a lot of these engines on the market. That's why we have uh, such, a, such a high number. Recreational boats also emit hydrocarbons, which is another source of, uh, another source of carbon, which puts together a bit higher number of the recreational, higher share of recreational boats. Um, as a second point, uh, the problem is not um, overall emissions in general, which, uh, which is emitted by recreational boats. But the problem is that the emissions emitted by boats are concentrated in uh, marinas, in small areas, which could be a health issue. Because if all the boats in peak times are running their engines at the same time, there could be quite high, high concentrations of carbons than, in the, than it, its average. And the third, point, the third point I would mention is also the EU commitment to decarbonize. We cannot forget that, because the uh, EU committed itself uh, to Green Deal. Everybody heard about Green Deal, uh, which means in uh, 2050, uh, European economy should produce uh, zero net carbon emissions, meaning uh, less carbon emissions to produce than to capture. And all the sectors are supposed to contribute to that. And, and we know that in some other sectors, like on-road sectors for cars and lorries and buses, there are initiatives, ambitious initiatives to decarbonize. In other sectors, like aviation and heavy maritime, there are already initiatives. And uh, if the recreational boating sector would, uh, would uh, lagging behind, that the share of carbon emissions would actually increase. So these are reasons. Yes, correct. Very interesting. What do you see if you, if you call it road to zero? I mean, the automotive industry is planning for 2035. And um, what do you think? Maybe a question for all of you. What is, what is possible? What is realistic? Comparing the car industry with the boating industry. Do we need 10 years more, 15 years more? I mean, 15 years is the uh, maximum. Robert? Yeah, I think you have to, to see the difference between what is coming into the market and what is already in the market. So since 2008, we uh, haven't uh, allowed two-stroke engines, but they are still in the market. So uh, we have to have the change, the new regulation, as soon as possible to run it for 10, 15, 20 years until we have the full impact. So I'm totally with Jan. Uh, when he says when, when we have in the marinas, we have a lot of emission, and uh, if we can electrify the harbors, for example, the marinas more, uh, we can run the stationary boats there almost emission-free. On the other hand, when we look how our industry is a niche in the niche engine-wise, so we have, the out we have the truck industry, we have the boat industry, we have the, the machinery industry, uh, industrial machinery industry, we have the automotive industry, what is smaller, and then we have our industry. Inventing the wheel new just for the very low number of engines we are selling compared to the engines made in the world, um, it's, quite different. It's, it's quite difficult. So we have to look at the developments on the, on the car side, on the industrial side, and try to implement it to our industry too. I'm personally not in favor of saying we go 100% electric, because that's just one way. We have to see the full picture. We have hydrogen, we have hybrid drives, we have um, the possibility of e-fuels, and we have to leave some doors open to go the way and just to shorten it. Yeah, but Vladimir, you, um, this may be a good topic for you. You started already 2008. What were your milestones and your restrictions and so on? What do you, you have two people here from the European Commission. You can address your wishes if you want. 
Yeah, the first of all, the uh, marine industry is quite wide uh, applications. For certain applications, definitely electric propulsion will take a place, definitely. But some of them should stay on the kind of propulsion system which allow you go far away on the long distance and a higher speed. But today, today we have no alternative uh, uh, diesel propulsion engines. Uh, what we did for from 2008, uh, we made a huge research regarding the use case of the customers, and we find out how we can present the customer new way of life. Uh, we call this gentleman boating, and uh, entering in marina and go out of marina, it's an electric propulsion system. It's already re resolved the problem. Uh, on the short trip, uh, up to 40 miles, we guarantee you electric propulsion system. But if you want to go Atlantic crossing on the uh, power boat, you know, this is a different topic. Also, distance like a 300 miles between islands in the Adriatic Sea, you need to have alternative, alternative to electric, something. Uh, we quite um, successfully developed the hybrid system and electric propulsion system, our own. And um, based on these numbers, uh, last year was 71% uh, of our uh, market shares between diesel and, uh, and electric. And this year, we expect more than 72%. <coughs> Probably next year or after, we will offer to the market only hybrid or electric, without diesel. OK, um, Robert already said, I mean, uh, electric engines are not the only uh, uh, possibility, and, but we have to get the marina um, uh, uh, somehow carbon neutral. Linos, um, but what do we need in the marina and in the infrastructure of the marina um, to get this right? Well, uh, we use the expression that uh, my colleague Felix Leitemann used yesterday. Uh, in order to go green in the, uh, in the, uh, the new tendency of the Commission, we have to go blue. And uh, in the marina, we have to make the marina clear infrastructure both on the green side, meaning on the earth, and on the water side. So we have to think in the future of the marina as being part of the neighboring city and not a part of it, meaning to be cleaner, to be more welcome for the people who are uh, going to visit it. And then in this way, and here I come to your, to, to your question, have it more welcoming both for boaters and for the visitors. And this brings the infrastructure of all that we have said here, to try to develop an infrastructure for any alternative powers like whatever can produce electricity that can be brought on the marina, why not on the boats, whenever it's possible. We see that there are some examples in European marinas where we have solar panels on the boats who produce electricity for the marina and then there is an exchange between the two. Or are there any other sources of energy there which would make the marina being clean, being, let's say, of low emissions, and being productive of, 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 of power, whatever this power comes from. But renewable power, not fossil power. I mean, try to find this alternative. This is what we are, let's say, our vision for the future. Now, it's an initiative that we want to start in the near future. It's not clear yet how we're going to approach it. That's why we try to cover with the industry here and other associations to see what's the sector waiting from the Commission to do on that, and what can we, from our mandate, from our treaties, do on that? So there is no legislation possible. It's just initiative on a coordination and see what sharing experience between different players to do that. That's what we try to do for the coming years. Is there already a roadmap that you say, okay, we have to achieve in 2025 this and 2030 this? Not really, because. I don't think it's our role to set a roadmap with the target for the people who are going to implement it afterwards without even asking them beforehand. So maybe it's good to see with them what can we do, what can they do, and then see how can we support them to achieve this, this goal, when and how. That's, let's say it's more to help than to impose something to them. Robert, do you have already something to mention to Linos? Yes, I think it's, it's most important that we, that we look at the whole picture. 
at the harbors, at the emissions, at the market, and also at our customers. So when we look at the average size of a boat, we talk about seven, eight meters. So these are not the mega yachts, one million, two million, ten million boats who say, okay, my boat is old, I buy a new one. Um, we have customers uh, who spend 5,000 or 10,000 euro for their boat. And um, we have to be sure that we keep these people, these customers in the market um, and, and having an infrastructure, but also shifting these boats into the next emission generation somehow. And what I said earlier, I think for these existing boats, e-fuels are the best opportunity. And when we look at the harbors, you usually have wind, so you can have a windmill power plant, and uh, sounds quite simple, but it's, it's easier than in the Bavarian forest um, to, to, to make electric power. And uh, so we can charge these boats um, or making e-fuel or whatever to run these boats. So the existing customers, we have to keep them in the industry because they are tourists at the end of the day and uh, not making turnover for our industry, but also for the tourism industry. If yes. I can add something yeah. to what Max just said, because he made me think of something that uh, we are doing as well in Digimaria about that. Uh, uh, you mentioned about the different other um, power supplies in the, in the ports. Uh, we must not forget as well that uh, in many, many uh, coastal cities, the marina is next to the commercial port. And uh, in Nijimari we have a, a, a forum, it's called the, it's a European Ports Forum subgroup, it's called Ports for Sustainable Blue Economy, uh, or Ports as Hubs for Sustainable Blue Economy. And this is, let's say, how to make things go bluer in the ports, especially when they are next to marina or when the marina is in the commercial port, which is the case of some uh, Mediterranean cities. And there we see many uh, synergies between the two, and we see in many cases ports who are producing uh, power and then giving to the marina or vice versa. Yeah. Uh, there are some cases like that. So this we're trying to combine the two together to, to see how, how can they work together. And the other thing I would like to say, which goes exactly with what uh, Robert said uh, before, is that we must not forget that the marinas, uh, well, this in the European Union, the mass majority of them are small marinas, uh, let's say micro enterprises, with very low uh, budgets to invest on digital technologies, where some others are already very autonomous and very modern. Uh, we have to think about them as well because uh, most of the yachts, or let's say the small boats, let's say, are there. So uh, we have to think how to help them as well with the neighboring city to uh, be more uh, user friendly, to have some, let's say, with the waste management and all these, uh, all these things. So there are many things that are developing as well. Maybe you're aware of the Port Reception Facilities, facilities Directive of DigiMove, so it's not of my responsibility, but it's, let's say it's coming with the miners as well. It has been recently revised so that the miners can have help from the city for the waste, for example, for, to go greener on the earth, as I was saying. So there are many initiatives that are going on to make it, let's say, come together and to make their, uh, their development easier. Yes, uh, uh, Vladimir, oh, yeah. Yeah, maybe Jan, you want to add? Or, but Vladimir, I mean, selling them these uh, e boards electric boards. I mean, what kind of infrastructure do your customer need in the ideal marina? Um, you know, it's first time customer come to our stand on our boat, we usually try to listen to him, what he wish and how we can help him. And his first impression is, oh yeah, electric boat, I would like to go 20 knots. You say, okay, what is the distance? Well, maybe 300 miles. I say, okay, show me on the map distance where you want to go in this kind of mode. And we are navigating, you know, Côte d'Azur, Adriatic Sea, Greek islands. And when we start to discuss close to reality, all of them say, yeah, two, three hours a day, maybe 10, 20 miles max. And after a simple calculation, we figure out this is speed and uh, energy consumption, which we easy can offer to the customer. And if he's still going from marina to marina, and he arrives afternoon to new marina and plug in on regular shore power, 
no supercharger station, not special grid, but regular, this blue one phase superchargers with the seven and a half kilowatts, 80 kilowatt hour battery bank could be charged for next uh, 12 hours. We call this overnight charging. In this respect, today, Marina, our customer in Marina, they are not struggling and they're not required any kind of special environment. No special chargers, no special docks. For regular dock, you come, you plug in, overnight you are full. And you can continue your trip on the electric boat. Also, we supply a full roof of solar energy, which cover your daily needs. Even you stay in the anchor bay, your boat is charging. Especially when summer season, it's sunny days. Yeah, it's not the winter where there's no sun like today in Düsseldorf. Yeah. Yeah. So this is for the hotel load during the night then, like uh, yeah, bigger boats? Yeah, during the night, mm. with the smart usage of the boat, if you are not uh, somewhere in the tropical area where you need mm. 24 hours air conditioning, but in Europe, uh, air conditioning uh, with the smart usage, you can stay days on the, on the bay. And uh, what would be interesting for me, um, the typical customer of Green Line, is this the new generation of owners, the younger generation, 30 to 40 years old, or all kinds of ages? In 2008, the average was like a 62 years on the beginning, because we started with a small model, and the small model was ex-sailors. They're almost adult, you know, and they have experience, and they know they need the boat which moving slow. And the first hour models moving slow. With the years, we understand it's new other customers who are interesting to have electric propulsion, but they still want to go 20, 25 knots on diesel engine. They will be happy to come in marina, to go out of marina, change the place between base by electric propulsion, but they, on the certain momentum, they want to go faster. Especially in the last three years after the pandemic started, we have uh, very big numbers of the newcomers. The first boater, the buying 14, 15, 16 meters boat. This is the first time. And all of them came only because of the hybrid and electric. Okay. It's, it's, it's market trend has changed. Yeah, we okay. try to uh, reacting on this yeah. fastly. Do, do you, selling engines and equipment, do you see this as well, Robert? Uh, the, the demand is there for, for uh, everything uh, new, so not demand, the interest. People are interested in, in all these new technologies. Um, due the time of Corona, we won a lot of people who started with water sports here in Germany, especially um, making holiday in Germany because flying was not so easy. And uh, so thousands of people came, also the young generation. This generation is much more digital, so um, they have totally different demands and they are more interested in motorboats than in sailing boats, so that is shifting much faster as expected. So um, you see it also on the show here that the hall one to six is almost overcrowded and, and the sailing boat um, area is, is, they have, they are growing from the size of the boats, but the new customers in the moment are starting with a smaller motorboat, what I said, 10,000, 15,000 euro. And, um, but they want to have it digital, they want to know when they are at home, is the battery charged or whatever. And they are much more service oriented. That's also what we learned. So their demand is not just placing their boat in the harbor and coming back next Friday. They want to have, I don't know, that the fridge is filled, um, that the fuel tank is filled up, the boat is clean and all this. So it's completely different than 30 years ago, where people came to the boat show, they wanted to know how do I make an inspection on my engine, not taking care about emission, but just that the engine runs. And um, so it's more service orient oriented and digital oriented. Okay, yes, it? Lino, yeah. If I can add something, because you give me some inspiration every time that you say some comments about what we are doing. Uh, we, uh, in the frame of the future of the marinas, there is, and let's say, uh, if I can call it sub-objective of that, which is the digital, uh, or the smart marinas. Uh, we are, since about one year, we try to see what's happening in terms of technology in the different marinas in Europe, to see some of them being already interconnected between them, totally digitalized. And uh, something that we thought that it is very interesting 
for all the boaters and the marinas in Europe for the future in the way we can do it is to have a connection and exchange of information between marinas and between the boat and the marina or the boat and the boat, uh, mainly for tourism. So it's the practical side because it makes the, the going in and out of the marina much easier and faster because the marina knows where the boat is coming, they know what the, what the boat is, what the, the owner of the boat needs, how long would we stay and when, when, when he leave. But there is also another issue, it's the security. When a boat is leaving for a marina, let's say, and I, Sina, whatever, from Genoa to go to Barcelona. So the boater or the skipper will say, okay, I leave this day from, from Genoa and I expect to arrive at this day and time in Barcelona with these needs. In case he doesn't arrive at that time, then maybe somebody can say, okay, what's happening? Why are you not here? Is there a problem somewhere? And then if there is no reply, maybe there's a question of security to send there uh, a, a rescue team to see whether something happened to him. So this is something we thought that it might be interesting to have it uh, developed, uh, or not only for the practical side, but also from the security side on that. Yes, and uh, bringing Jan uh, in again, because I think he has the best overview. We were talking about electric drives and e-fuels. What other options are there for the audience, for the people watching on screen? What other options of uh, alternative propulsion, of sustainable propulsion systems are there? Do we have some, some more to talk about? I think my commercial colleagues know <laughs> much more about that. Um, however, um, we can divide it into basically three main groups according to um, the source of energy, let's say. That the source of energy for the moving of boat uh, can be taken either from fuel tanks or from batteries or from fuel cells. And uh, from fuel tanks, everybody knows. Um, the, uh, traditional combustion engines fueled by petrol or diesel. However, um, the um, electric engines or hybrid engines, which are using batteries, um, the electricity in the battery uh, can be taken from, from different sources here. It can be taken from inshore sources, where the energy could be renewable or not. It can be taken from solar panels, or it can be taken from wind energy. And our target should be that uh, not only the operation of the craft is clean, let's say, so the uh, boat's propulsion will be electric, but also electricity, which is <coughs> used uh, for, for the operation of the boat, should be from renewable resources. Um, because it, it can, it can easily be that uh, uh, electricity uh, for the electric boat is taken from the fossil fuels and uh, we still have the carbon footprint there. I mentioned also fuel cells and this is, uh, let's say, the newest um, method of propulsion and uh, where the fuel cells are uh, fueled by hydrogen. And here we have also uh, plenty, of do, uh, plenty of do, because um, the uh, European Commission established in 2020 <coughs> uh, the so-called Hydrogen Alliance, Clean Hydrogen Alliance, and the, the goal for this alliance is to um, collect the industry, industrial players, um, the, the producers of boats, uh, the uh, producers of hydrogen, clean hydrogen, the uh, renewable resources like uh, windmills and, uh, and solar energy, uh, together, together with boat manufacturers, and to look for the ways how to uh, involve, how to include this new appearing, new emerging technology into, into the boating. Because um, if we have if, the, if we have uh, renewable energy for the batteries, and if we have uh, clean hydrogen or clean <coughs> hydrogen, if you want, for, for fuel cells, then we can say that we de decarbonize the recreational boating industry. But uh, do, do you involve also the big shipyards? Because I'm somehow very involved in the super yacht industry. And um, uh, there's one shipyard in Germany already installing a fuel cell uh, on a 
it's a cruise ship at the moment, but this will leave in, in, in this summer. Um, what do you think, is it, when is it ready for, I mean, smaller boats, when at all, if at all? What are the restrictions for smaller boats? I mean, on a big boat, I can imagine. Um, it has to be quite smaller, right? Indeed. Um, it's, it's difficult to say any date. It would be uh, like fortune telling. However, uh, I would agree with the, with the statement that it's necessary to reduce carbon emissions uh, on tailpipe emissions, but also uh, to decarbonize fuels and to, um, to use the renewable energy and to, to green uh, our marinas. Uh, to create uh, the appropriate infrastructure for batteries and for fuel cells. This all together can uh, only uh, contribute to the, to the overall success. And um, to the date, um, we can take an example of on-road applications because uh, we know that the European Commission is proposing a new standard emission standard for the cars and lorries and buses, which is called Euro 7, and uh, which is supposed to completely decarbonize any new vehicle which is placed on the market after 2035. So no new car placed on the market after 2035 should emit uh, carbon dioxide or carbon, uh, carbon, carbon emissions. This is one initiative. Another commission's initiative, which is submitted to legislators now, is uh, developing of related infrastructure, which means that um, there is some limit for uh, recharging stations, batteries, and for fuel cells. Uh, to my knowledge, uh, in, the, in this proposal, it stated that every six meters should be a charging station for and every 150 kilometers should be charging station for fuel cells. So if we succeed to do it, to put it together, then uh, we, can, we can say it. And um, all the technologies needs to be tested on road first. And then usually uh, technology spill over to marine applications. So uh, we will see what will happen in this on-road application, what is actually political will, because this, these commission's proposals are going to the European Parliament and the Council and will be negotiated. So what will we actually support? Because everywhere is just technological side and also economic side. Um, if we want to have good rule, uh, the technology has to be technically feasible, but also economically bearable. Manufacturers have to be able to invest their money and to put it on the market. Customers will need to buy it because if customers will not buy new technologies, then they will stay with other technologies. And this, is, this wouldn't be our goal. So we have to um, closely look at what's the development in uh, on-road applications, what's the development in aviation and heavy maritime industry, because, as I said, there are also new initiatives to decarbonize. And then um, our target is to come up with uh, also ambitious proposal to decarbonize or to decrease emissions from recreational boats. Yeah, I think the on-road testing, I, there was one result of this study, and they said, um, the customer said, okay, they don't trust really this electric solutions. Huh? I mean, it's, I think it's the same on the road uh, at the moment. Huh? Um, but um, I attended a conference of the Ferretti Group yesterday, quite a big player in the market, and they are testing now their first, really first uh, e-boat, uh, 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 Riva, with an electric propulsion system. And they said, we don't have to oversell this sustainable topic. Is that a risk? Everything is sustainable now? And we don't have the real product? Is that a risk? First of all, I, I want to answer to Jan, because um, we highly appreciate that you say it has to be proven on road. Because the big difference is on safety aspects. When you have uh, heavy rain and wind, you stop your car, 
and wait until the ADAC will come or somebody else who helps you. But when you have uh, 12 before on the Mediterranean Sea or on the North Sea and um, your engine broke down, nevertheless, if it's a combustion engine or an electric engine or whatever, you are in real trouble. So we need proven systems. And um, the on-road industry is the next, next level for us, so we learn from them. And um, the, 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 the question you, you, you said, um, do we overestimate it? I, I don't think so. I think it's very important to do the steps now and to decide what to do, that we have the time to implement it into the running system. So I'm, I highly appreciate that you say, or that the EU says, let's look what is on the market, what happens on the market, how can we transport energy, is it hydrogen, is it fuel cell, is it e-fuel, is it a battery, whatever, but let's look on the solutions and not saying this is the solution. I think the, mo the best things were invented in a free market and not by legislation. If I, if I complement to this one, for example, a new heavy maritime initiative speaks about zero emission technology. So uh, the, the legislation is made to be technologically neutral. It doesn't speak about electric propulsion, hybrid propulsion or fuel cells propulsion. No, just zero emission technology. Vladimir, you were smiling all the time. Not all the time. <laughs> <laughs> Not all the time. No. Um, the Volkswagen Group last year spent 60 billion euros just to develop the concept and technology to be on the 2035 out of uh, combustion engines. You know, 60 billion, one automotive producer. This kind of support, no one industrial boat builder has. This is the one topic. Another topic. Look on the automotive industry. How easy a combustion engine driver can change his mind and go to the electric car. What he sacrifice when he choose between combustion and electric? Almost nothing. He get instead of car, he get the gadget, which we know everybody like. Everything on app. You can move your car, you can start the condition, you can open the doors, you can make a ventilation. You know where is the, your car located. Speed. It's the same speed like it was before. Even some cars have the more performance, like a Tesla, like a Taycan. It's no sacrifice, nothing sacrifice. And uh, distance, no. The superchargers available, very easy on the Europe and the United States. It's the grid of superchargers are crazy. But when we talk about the nautical industry, what the regular cruiser captain need to sacrifice to switch from diesel engine to electric propulsion engine. Everything. Distance, speed, time, price. You know, and what he get? Safety. What he get compared to this? He became greener or bluer. You know, this is very, very difficult to change the mindset. We're working on this more than 10 years. And uh, we see how people change when we properly made introduction to the customers who never think about electric or hybrid boats. When they step on the boat, we leave marine on electric drive. Most of them is shock. Something wrong, what is the engine? The engine is not running, you know. The wife say, oh, wait, 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 this is electric. I love it, you know. We need to work together with the customer side, with the captain side, with marina side, and we call this program, you know, gentlemen boat. It's not, we can build a green line for you. It's a green boat. But captain who know, have no idea how to use it, how to make it green, it's no results, you know. The marina where he arrived should be also green. You know, the dealers who sell it to him also should be green. It's a huge teamwork around to move all this uh, industry which are mainly it's a fun. It's not the transport. We're not the cars. Cars is commodity. You cannot live without car, but without boat, easy. This is the uh, fun. How to make a life fun with the, some small sacrifice features. 
Yeah, very, very true. Um, what I heard, uh, for example, the very good influencers uh, or very good influencers, the Instagram generation. So the kids yeah. of the existing customers uh, telling, okay, daddy, we want a sailing board, we want an electric board, we want an electric car because we, this is the world we will live in. Is this something you hear? I, that's what is my impression. Yeah, sure, true. Robert as well, so the kids are influencing already the existing customers now? Or? Yes, of course. So, so what I said, the, 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 the interest is there, um, but we cannot change the world from one day to the other. So um, we have to show opportunities, we have to get guidelines, um, within we have to work, so nobody is free anymore. Um, that's, that's okay. Um, and the EU or whoever has to make the guidelines uh, in which we are developing new solutions and um, we have to be in, in contact with this generation, this Instagram generation or digital generation, um, what are their demands or what are their wishes and how and when can we fulfill it. So what do you say? Um, what is the sacrifice and when will it happen? Thank you, gentlemen. Very good final statement. It's a boat show. You have to sell. You have to work. Um, thank you for listening, and thank you for attending this first panel here today. Thank you. So we have a lunch break now, and then we will go on at 1.30 uh, here.